I'm Dr. Stan Bratton, Executive Director of the Network of Religious Communities, and I thank you for joining us on this edition of In Process, a continuing discussion of significant issues, events, and concerns affecting our lives and the lives of our congregations and our community. It is a basic teaching of Buddhism that everything changes like a river flowing on and on and ever-changing. Nations changes, cities change, people change, and the news changes all the time. In the United States, we're in the midst of a political process which will determine how much change we will have in our national leadership. And also religious leaders change. The Network of Religious Communities has had a president for the last two years, Dr. Vijay Chakavarthi, who fulfilled his term limits. And so recently we elected a new president. On this edition of In Process, we'll have an opportunity to converse with the new president of the Network of Religious Communities. And I think you'll find him a fascinating person. He's going to be able to talk about his involvements in other parts of the world and some major projects here in western New York as well as, um, as nationally. So we'll have a good time talking with our new president. But just before that, uh, normally we have a list of religious holidays and events. But given some of the changes that are going on at, um, at the TV station, we're not able to put them on the screen. So just let me mention that on February 22nd, Christians will be celebrating Ash Wednesday. And on the 27th, the Eastern Christians will have the first day of the Great Fast, or Lent. In Hinduism, we'll be commemorating Shiva on the 20th of February, and Holi, a commemoration honoring Krishna on March 8th. And of course, Judaism will be commemorating the Fast of Esther on the 7th of March. We want to thank all of you for joining us in this edition, and very happy to welcome the Reverend Dr. Jonathan Lawrence who is the recently elected president of the Network of Religious Communities. Thank you, Stan. I'm, Welcome. I'm pleased to be here. And uh, we want to spend some time kind of helping people to get to know you and the kind of interesting journey of your life that had so many different weavings and so forth, which may reflect some of the things that you have brought to kind of illustrate some of your journeys. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you. And you uh, actually uh, a, 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 a native of Western New York, or nearly so. That, that, that's correct. I was born in Connecticut, but my parents moved to the Rochester area, to Hilton, when I was very young. My father is a retired American Baptist minister, and so he served congregations uh, in, in New York State and is Pennsylvania. And so we lived for 10 years in Lewiston while he served a congregation in Niagara Falls. Well, that was kind of formative as for you as well, growing up in Niagara Falls, uh, particularly uh, at a critical time. Th that, that's right. We arrived in town six months after Love Canal had hit the news, and my father was invited to be the Baptist representative on the ecumenical task force, which served to try to assist the residents of the Love Canal neighborhood as they dealt with the health challenges they faced. Now, when you look back at yourself, how old were you at that time? I, I was nine. So what, what was that experience like for you? Did that, uh, were you much aware of well, I didn't understand the ecological the, issues? I didn't, understand the, I didn't understand the environmental impact, but I did see that he was working very closely with people of other traditions. So we would have the local rabbis um, over for dinner, and we met the nuns from Stella Niagara and um, met several of the priests and people from all the different Christian denominations. And it was, it was really great as a child to see them working together and, and to get to know these people as friends and recognize that we were all serving a, a common, common purpose to help the community. Now, when you started out, it was not to follow your father's footsteps, though. No, for the longest time, I actually said, heck no, or perhaps even stronger. and. Um, as, as, as I went to college, I was planning to become a doctor and hoped to serve in something like uh, Doctors Without Borders. But instead, I discovered I really wasn't enjoying the pre-med classes. And so as I finished college, I started looking to go towards, towards seminary. But I took a detour for a year. 
Well, but part of your diversity also, you went to a Quaker college. That's right. That's right. Uh, Haverford College in Philadelphia. It's a small school, and I really enjoyed learning from the Quakers and another tradition. There, there were some challenges at the college be because at times the Christian students did not always get along together. Some of them felt I was not Christian enough. And so for several years, I actually spent time going on Sunday afternoons to Catholic Mass with some of my friends and created a little bit of confusion when one friend's parents met me and could see that her parents were sort of thinking, oh, nice Catholic boy, friends with our daughter. And when I explained that I was Baptist, they sort of scratched their heads. And apparently later her mother says, so what's the deal with John? And she says, well, Ma, who do you mean? You know, Cousin John, Uncle John, who do you mean? Well, you know, John, John the Baptist. And so then a few years later when I went, or when she came to my ordination, she brought an icon <laughs> of John the Baptist that her aunt had made. And it still hangs on my office wall. And St. John the Baptist. That's right. And when, so. my, when my daughter was three, she pointed at the wall and says, why is that man shouting? And I had to try to explain the, the story. Well, what is it did you learn from the Quakers uh, during your time there? The, one of the biggest things that I really enjoyed experiencing what was the attempt to find consensus and to hold off on decisions until the community could could come to agreement that and find a solution that was acceptable to everyone rather than than just saying okay well we have a 51 percent majority and so we're going to do whatever we want and you can't say anything because we voted uh, but really the the process of working as a community to try to find solutions that that meet the needs of everyone in the community. Well, it, it, you can see the challenges of that as well. Uh, recently, um, the Occupy Buffalo group works by consensus. That, that's right. And when they were pre presented with a new proposal from the city, they had to go work on consensus, couldn't arrive at it in time, and at the end, uh, all their belongings were thrown in the dumpster and they were moved off that's, that's right. to Niagara Square. How, the challenge of working with consensus, but how important that is, when you have a lot of diversity. Exactly, exactly. Uh, it's interesting though, one of our Quaker representatives always points out though, the normal rule is that when you're involved in that, you don't keep talking though. That's right. That you have one opportunity, unless really moved, so everybody has an opportunity to speak, but not the same people again and exactly. again, which often exactly. occurs. Now, you went from a Quaker college to take a year uh, where? I went to Jerusalem. There, there was an opportunity to study at Hebrew University. It was a program mostly faced on, facing political science and seeking to develop leadership. And so we, we studied uh, modern Israeli history. We studied major leader figures in, in, in the last several hundred years. And it was an attempt to bring American students over to Israel and so we had projects we were supposed to work on together. But for me, the, the best part was just being able to be there and to travel around and to, to experience the, well, you know, as some people like to say, the, the, the stones that Jesus walked on. Um, I doubt I actually walked on any of the pathways that Jesus walked himself, but to, to experience that, to, to get a sense of the, of the geography and the culture. And for me, the fun thing was also seeing people from so many different places around the world and, and also in many cases seeing Muslims and Jews and Christians live together in community and find a way, find a way to work together despite the, the political struggles and, and, and the very real challenges, challenges that they face. Now, is that one of the insights that you have of how closely people live and work together there that you don't always get through the news coverage here in in america oh I, ab absolutely i mean dur during during that trip and and later trips to jerusalem i've made friends on all sides of the political spectrum both within in the jewish community and the muslim community and and so many people over there you know have those kind of cross cross-cutting connections and so it's for me it's not so much a matter of trying to say well which side am i on but of recognizing that I have friends on, on all sides of that conflict who, who really do struggle and, and struggle to, to find ways to keep their families safe and their, and their communities safe. 
Well, uh, often, uh, whenever things heat up in the Middle East, uh, we have religious communities that are ties to both traditions and, uh, and, and other traditions as well. Uh, what kind of insights do you bring when those conflicts heat up locally? I, I'm not always sure what insights I can offer other than, as I say, you know, recognizing that I, that I have friends and I have relationships that sort of cross these boundaries. And in some ways, I think that's the important thing for our own community is to have those relationships already. It, it's difficult to build that kind of connection when suddenly there's a crisis and you have to right away be building that connection. But even as we've seen in recent years here in Buffalo, when we have those kind of connections across the communities, and and so when there's a problem, it's not just sort of a name that we're talking about, but it, but it's you know someone we've met before, and we know that that they seem to be a decent, reasonable person, and so even though we know we're disagreeing with them, hopefully we can we can step back and say, okay, well I've I've worked with this person before, I know I know they they try to be a good person, so we can try to, to continue that relationship. Well, we talk about the important thing of respecting That's the right. other person, that you may not always agree, you may have great disagreements, That's right. but within that boundary of being able to respect and say, I know you are a person of integrity. Exactly. Uh, this isn't just something on the surface, uh, that, but you feel deeply, you believe deeply in this, but I respect you as a human being, as a person, as a friend. That's right. That's right. Now, after the year of Jerusalem, what then? I went to Pittsburgh Theological Seminary. It's a Presbyterian Church USA now, seminary. Let's see, there's American <laughs> Baptist, then it was Quaker, then Jerusalem. Yes. And now Presbyterian. Presbyterian. My parents were living in the Pittsburgh area at the time, and so it was nice to actually be near near where they, they were. Mm -hmm. And um, also, I, I was lucky enough to receive some nice scholarship assistance. And so, so uh, I was very pleased pleased to spend some time there, and um, then started realizing that while I wanted to be ordained in the sense of being able to be involved in church life and, and take a leadership role, I did not necessarily want to serve full-time as a congregational leader, and so I started looking to go on to graduate school afterwards. And the way I tried to explain it to people who said, well, why do you need to be ordained to teach, is that, that I like to think of teaching as a ministry. Um, particularly if I'm teaching about the Bible and about religious matters, these are, these are things that are, that are important to our students, and if handled the wrong way or, or, or handled in a very heavy-handed way that says, well, why would you believe something like that, um, it, it can be very destructive to, to a student, student's understanding of themselves and their understanding of the pla their place in the world. And so, as a teacher, when I challenge them, I also try to support them and, and, and help them see that, that even if I'm asking them to question what they, what they believe or question why they believe something, then I'm not trying to say that it's unimportant for them to believe. Well, before we move on as well, at, at a Presbyterian seminary, what did you learn about Presbyterians? What kind of insights did you gather that you brought along? Well, uh, cer certainly the, the sense of history and, and, again, the sense of trying to work together. You know, th there have been, over the years, many disputes within the Presbyterian Church and the sense of trying to hold the group together and find ways um, through, through the process, through the, through the representative process that, that represents each congregation and, and each congregation in the presbytery and then in the synods and on the national level. Different than American Baptist, then. That's right. Well, we also have a representational system, but there's a lot more autonomy for individual congregations than, than there is in the Presbyterian system. So you uh, were graduated, completed your work at the Presbyterian Seminary in Pittsburgh, and then? Then, then I went on to, on to Notre Dame in Indiana for for my doctorate. The famous Notre Dame. Yeah, yes, indeed. indeed. And so here's this Baptist, Quaker, Presbyterian, uh, Middle Easterner who then goes to Notre Dame. That's right. That was quite a change. Yes. Um, I, I liked it. The, the, the resources and, and the community that were there was, was really, really exciting. Um, there, there were times uh, there would be debates every year about whether the cafeterias should serve meat on Fridays during Lent, 
and you know it just was never had never been a big issue for me and so there there were times that that there were things going on that just were hard for me to connect to but but on on many levels it was great and particularly again being at a school where the academic component was taken seriously but also the faith component and and that was one of the things as i looked for a place to teach once I got my degree, I wanted to find a place where, where both sides of that could be, could be taken seriously. Now, what was your focus uh, at Notre Dame? This was at you were working then on the PhD right. level. Uh, my, my dissertation and much of my studies w were in looking at early Jewish-Christian relations, and very specifically hmm. looking at the ways that Christian understandings of baptism grew out of Jewish understandings of water purification. And so I, I looked at the archaeological and textual development of these of these practices, because in in many cases, if you just look at the archaeological structure that that was found on an excavation, you know, there's of course no labels. You know, it doesn't say Jesus was here or anything like that. Right. And from a structural perspective, early baptismal fonts and many Jewish mikvah oats, uh, a mikvah is, is a a Jewish immersion bath mm -hmm. look very similar and so it's not 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 to say not to say that they were used by both community that a particular bath was used by both communities but that from a structural design perspective the two practices were, were very similar and that similarity even continued in the centuries when Judaism and Christianity were growing further apart as religious communities now some would say well how does that apply uh, to what is going on today, to what you would teach uh, students right. well, in your own classroom. Well, well it, it, in, in, in the sense of saying that, that, that we have these shared traditions and we have these symbols and, the, and these, these concepts that, that are important to both of us and are understood in very distinct ways and yet, yet have connections. And as um, I went to a conference a couple years ago um, where I was one of very, very few, um, if, if perhaps the only Christian at a Jewish conference talking about uh, ritual bathing. And in many ways, it helped me reflect on the seriousness of something like baptism um, and, and, and the care with which the Jewish community places in just the kind of structures and the kind of water you use. Um, in some ways, I think as Christians, we could take that more seriously, that even though Christian baptism is only done done once compared to Jewish ritual immersion, which can be done, you know, repeated times throughout one's life, the seriousness of it is important. And, and the actual ritual has importance rather than just, okay, you've been baptized, that's the, that's the important thing. The actual care of how we do it also becomes important. Now, you received your PhD uh, from Notre Dame, and then? And then, well, I taught at Notre Dame for two years and, hmm. um, until I Found the what job. did you teach? The freshman introduction to theological studies. It was trying to teach all of the Bible, um, Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, the New Testament, and five centuries of church history, all in 16 weeks. <laughs> okay. uh, not, not an easy task. For uh, how many students? Uh, I usually had 40 or so students in a class, and sometimes I had two or three classes. So after that, did you then uh, move uh, to We Canisius? moved to Buffalo. Uh, I, got, I got the job at Canisius, and um, they, were, they were worried. They said, well, sometimes we have to teach um, you know, several classes. And I said, well, even several classes of 25 is still smaller than the number I had been teaching sometimes. <laughs> so it, it, ba it balanced out. Uh, so it's been a um, great opportunity. Uh, at Canisius, you teach? I teach the, the first first course in religion that everyone has to take. Um, I sometimes teach in the honors program. I teach the, the Hebrew Bible class, the Old Testament. And then now I, I'm teaching a class for seniors to sort of round out and pull together the components of their, their classes. Now you've had some interesting travel with students uh, that's, since being at that's right. That's right. Uh, um, Several years ago, I had the chance to travel with uh, Tim Watkins, one of my colleagues, to India with students. And then after that, I had the chance to lead the trip for myself. And so I, I went over once 
on my own to, to make the arrangements and then, then brought students and another faculty member. And again, the, the sense of watching and participating in the, in the interactions, seeing how different communities, um, in, how, how they share things when they can and how they yet keep their, their distinctiveness. And so the fact that um, in many of the churches in India where I visited, when it was time to pass the peace, you know, at many Christian churches, you would shake hands, right. or some people hug and pat on the back. Um, many of the churches I visited, they would namaste, just like um, just like Hindus and Hindus do. And um, you know, if you think of what that means to Hindus, I've heard it explained as you know, the spirit in me greets the spirit in you. Well, that, that's a concept that that can be incorporated very nicely with, without without harming. Christian teaching and without disrespecting Hindu teachings as well. And, and so, so what, watching those ways of interaction and watching, for instance, the fact that um, this is a wall hanging of the Last Supper that I brought back from India, where you see you have, you have Jesus here at the top and, and he, he's seated around the table, not on chairs, not on benches, but seated more on a more traditional yeah, on way the on the floor and they're all dressed in Indian, more Indian style clothing and, and not, not the way uh, um, you know, fam famous European artists might, might have portrayed him. And, and just watching those symbols and wa watching how, how that interaction comes. And, and again, finding ways to, to keep true to each person's tradition and yet borrow, borrow some of those, those concepts and, and really learn from each other. Well, uh, in terms of India, the, the encounter uh, from such, you know, thousands of years of history, which is so different than living in America. That's right. That's right. And 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 the fact that that events that might seem like ancient history to us because they're they're centuries and centuries ago are still relevant and commemorated every year and and have an impact on, on politics. You know, there, there have been fights over you know, who, who has the rights to a particular holy site. And, and find, finding ways, again, to, to understand and share those things, or, or, or at least respect those traditions, becomes very important. Well, also, did you encounter the uh, great technological developments that are going on in India? Well, yes, although it was kind of funny in a sense that, you know, everyone in America comments about all the technology available there, and yet in many cases we had trouble finding a place to connect to the Internet and, and send messages home. Um, but, but yes, the, the, the connections there and, and, and the, the, the speed at which it is growing is, is quite impressive. Now, recently uh, you had been involved in a project, in fact, just returned for one of them, the uh, President Obama's uh, initiative on uh, campus uh, service right. challenge. That's right. Uh, I always forget the exact, the precise right. name of it, but, <laughs> it's rather but the, long. The, the, <laughs> the primary idea, and it's connected to the Office of Faith-Based Partnerships, is to get colleges to continue. I mean, most colleges on, in the country have some for to, form of service, community service, volunteerism, whatever you want to call it, but to, to be very intentional about connecting with our communities um, reaching out across interfaith lines. And so when the invitation came out in Buffalo, we um, talked with people from several other schools and said, we're, we're already doing service of some sort. Instead of doing our individual projects, let's see if we could work together. So we actually have six or seven schools from this area. Oh, that's remarkable. I, I'm probably not going to remember the whole list right now, right. but trying to bring them together itself has been a challenge, but also very rewarding to get the ideas and the energy from that. But we, we've selected uh, working with the refugee communities here in Buffalo mm. at, as our focus for this year. We're calling it Making Buffalo Home and trying, trying to, to work with some of the local partners working in the refugee community, but also to work, work to see ways that we can engage the students in, in, the, in the broader societal and political concerns political in the sense of the, the global politics that influences them and, and has brought some of these refugees here to America. 
Now, you were just returned from, from Washington yes. uh, for a meeting of yes. this group. What was that experience like? Well, it, it was really exciting because there, um, there were students from across, across the country, different campuses, many of them facing some of the same challenges, how to build interfaith connections on their campuses the same way we've been trying in, in the broader community. And, and it, was, it was very exciting. And, and they, they gave us practice at, at ways of doing some of these activities. Now, you've also undertaken a new project at yes. Canisius yes. Uh, uh, regarding religious communities. Uh, I'm calling it the Religion in Western New York Project. And the simplest way to put it is that I'm trying to give people a chance to tell their own stories. Um, my students in, in my classes at the college are amazed sometimes to realize just how diverse Western New York is, and some of them will say, well, you know, I've driven past that building for years. I didn't realize it was a church, or I didn't realize it was a synagogue or a mosque. And so I'm sending students out to visit these places. I'm having students interview their own family members about their experiences as whatever religion they may be. And uh, I'm working to get those interviews onto the web so that mm. they are available. And if I keep doing this for several years, I'll get a nice cross-section of the community so that people here can see it, but also so that if someone in other parts of the country where perhaps there aren't any Muslims wants to know, know more about an example of how Muslims worship and pray and interact in their communities, we'll have actually several to say, well, here's this pe people from this mosque or that mosque or, or others. Well, uh, with that wealth of background, uh, you are now elected as uh, president of the Network of Religious Communities. Any thoughts about uh, what you would like to see happen uh, in the next year or so? Well, in, in many ways, just to continue um, what's been doing to, to energize people, you know, sometimes nonprofit groups can, can start to feel a little bit overwhelmed, particularly with, with budgetary processes. But there's so much we can do, and particularly ways we can partner with other groups in the community and with each other and to know, okay, well, if this group is already doing a workshop on something, let's work with them rather than try to schedule a separate event. But really, for me, just, just the sense, as I say, of building those relationships, building those connections so that when there is a problem, um, that was one of the things that really impressed me when, when the plane crashed a couple years ago. Mm -hmm. Because of the connections that the network had, we could put together a memorial service, an interfaith memorial service, very quickly. You know, many communities, if you didn't have those connections, you'd be scrambling and struggling to get that to get that together. And and so to to keep those relationships strong, even in the midst of times when, because of global politics or national politics, there 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 may be friction between some of our communities. Well, Reverend Dr. Jonathan Lawrence, a person with again very varied and interesting background and the recently elected president of the Network of Religious Communities. We thank you for joining us on this edition of In Process, and I thank all of you for joining us on In Process. In Process will be back next month with a new edition. In the meantime, I hope to see you at your house of worship.